and welcome to um, to the Carrot Results webinar. Um, I'd like to uh, just remind people we are calling in from many lands across uh, both north and south of the 49th parallel. Um, a lot of the lands up here are unseeded, um, and the seeds we work with are unseeded. And um, I would just consider that we uh, think about that when we talk about things like breeding projects and um, seeds that we're sharing with one another, um, that these these seeds are, the, the hope is that these are going to be um, shared and, and uh, spread out and um, we're perpetuating all the work that has done for generations before us. Um, we are going to um, start the webinar shortly. I'll just give a brief overview of what we're going to be hearing. We're going to um, these are as you probably saw in the in the introduction to the webinar and the invite that we are two overlapping projects again uh, north and south of the 49th parallel and that the uh, the two projects are CIOA and the Kenobi projects. Um, we are sharing various lines of carrots, and um, we're, so we're going to hear about how those two projects overlap. We're going to get a bit of a description then of the breeding lines and the varieties that we have used in the trials and where they came from. And then we're going to take a short 10 minutes just for a Q&A session on those. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll field them during the Q&A. Um, after that, um, we will have a presentation of the actual results uh, from both, again, north and south of the 49th parallel. And then we will have um, a discussion and, and sort of information about where we go beyond 2020-23, uh, uh, what's happening in 2024 and beyond. Um, but we're going to start with uh, Michaela and Phil um, going over an overview of the, the two projects. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Michaela Colley with Organic Seed Alliance, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with Phil Simon here in this presentation, but also in uh, carrot research and carrot breeding. Um, Phil's going to give a little bit more background on the work of, of uh, CIOA beyond the actual breeding, uh, but it's all very integrated, better understanding how carrots perform under different environments and interactive with soils and pests. So um, welcome everyone. Phil, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and get started? Sure, thank you, Michaela, and thank you, David. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today. I'm Phil Simon, I'm the, the uh, US Department of Agriculture uh, carrot breeder and geneticist and uh, um, you know, have been have been uh, working on carrot breeding for several decades, and and um, the the project brought uh, Michaela and OSA and I together, as well as some other uh, collaborators, to uh, ask the question of uh, why we need to improve carrots for organic production. So, uh, I don't know, Michaela, you want to give any more background before we dive into slides? Uh, yeah, we've had the pleasure to to partner with the Canovi Group since I want to say 2017 or so. Um, so it's been quite a while that we've been exchanging seed across the borders, and I just want to extend the gratitude for an opportunity to have this kind of uh, international collaboration that uh, we're really working together to to um, to breed more carrots for organic farmers. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So the the rationale for the CIOA project, uh, which CIOA stands for Carrot Improvement for Organic Agriculture, uh, is the fact that uh, at this point in history, about 25% of the U.S. carrot crop area is organic production. Uh, I don't know the Canadian numbers, but uh, that's, it's a fairly large amount from a standpoint of most vegetable crops, and about 13% of the sales are in the, from our, the organic production. So uh, there's certainly a, a, an audience of uh, stakeholders, uh, growers, uh, 
shippers, processors, and end consumers that are interested in organic uh, carrot, uh, organically grown carrots. And that raises the question of what exactly is it that uh, growers uh, might be interested in looking for. Uh, one of the attractions in the organic industry that has not been uh, advanced as much in, con in the conventional production industry is the, not only the use of orange carrots, but novel colors. So the CIOA project uh, has a large focus on novel colors of carrots. Of course, to grow carrots, you need, to, especially for organic systems, you need to have some form of disease and pest resistance and breeding for resistance uh, for nematodes and, and alternaria leaf blight and other uh, diseases is uh, one of the things that we include our, in our uh, in the USDA care breeding program. One interesting uh, aspect of organic production of carrots uh, that uh, is a tough one is uh, weed competitiveness because, of course, for conventional carrots, you can use herbicides, but not for organic, and that means the carrots need to do the job of weed competition, and that translates to looking for, for carrots with better early vigor and uh, quick growth of the canopy. Uh, and then uh, among the other things we look at from a grower perspective is longer post-harvest storage to accommodate the crop that's in the coolers for organic growers so they can get them to consumers. Uh, I think that's all we got on this slide. Uh, and Michaela, you want to chime in on any of this or how do you want to? Yeah, sure. So most of you probably know that when it comes to organic growers and eaters, uh, there's a lot of interest in diversity and in culinary quality, and a lot of the novel colors have a reputation for not having as good of flavor as some of the orange nonce type, the snacking carrots. I know my children ask me, Mom, is it a tasty carrot if I give them a carrot before they actually accept it? Um, and it's been really fascinating working with Phil to better understand some of that background of flavor in the novel colors. and. There's no genetic reason specifically that the novel colors are less flavorful. One of the things Carrot or uh, Phil's been doing in his work over 30 years is integrating uh, better flavor into some of those novel color backgrounds. And so just celebrating the diversity, uh, the culinary quality, um, and uh, and also I would also say that over the course of Phil's program, he's also been uh, evaluating, researching, and breeding for specifically improved nutritional quality. And um, there's a lot of benefit for that for the organic sector. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yep. So, so, uh, maybe to talk about some, the, some of the major uh, focal points for the CIOA project. Uh, um, the, they, they include, uh, as you might ascertain from what we've said so far, the development of new cultivars or new breeding stocks to, to create new cultivars and developing and releasing. And I'll be talking about what the release process means from my standpoint, uh, working for the USDA. Um, and uh, as part of that cultivar development, we needed to do a trial various breeding stocks of carrots uh, uh, across the country and, and, uh, and uh, in, into Canada for that matter. Uh, to, to look for their, um, their field productivity aspects uh, in the whole process of, of, of cultivar development. Um, as, as part of the research team, uh, we've had a, an interesting, significant side project by a couple of our collaborators that we'll mention as we go along, looking at uh, the, the interaction between the root microbiome of carrots uh, with with the carrot crop and how that plays into uh, um, organic production, disease resistance, and, uh, and things like that. I'll say a little bit about that as we go along, um, go, but looking at some of the key uh, traits that we're interested in improving for in this you know, for consumers and growers is, uh, as was already mentioned, improving the flavor and post harvest storage. Uh, for the nematode, uh, for as part of the disease resistance and pest resistance uh, aspects of the project, we're looking at the resistance uh, root knot nematodes, and uh, we're using molecular markers to better facilitate and improve the speed of that process. And of course, there's a significant outreach and education aspect of the project. So, um, so as part of the uh, cultivar development and release, 
uh, uh, again, as was noted earlier, we're looking for new uh, brilliant colors and improved flavor uh, as we're developing these new carrots for, with a focus for organic production. Um, and uh, in the process of, of uh, the plant breeding, this is a multi-year process. And at some point we come to the point of saying, this is good enough to uh, make the seed of this carrot available to to uh, individuals that want to trial it, to seed companies, and to growers and uh, other growers. And so that's that's what the term release refers to: is to make the seed available uh, to these various uh, growers and uh, and and, uh, and processors. Uh, and and this results in uh, the creation of new breeding lines. And we'll show you some pictures of some of those. I uh, will mention that uh, we've tapped into a very large collection of heirloom carrots that that exist in the USDA uh, Ag Research Service germplasm collection, which some of you may know as GRIN, the Germplasm Resources Information Network. Uh, and uh, we we've uh, included an, e an evaluation of about 600 open pollinated uh, heirloom and exotic carrots from that collection as part of this project. And some of those are being uh, folded into the breeding uh, for some of the uh, growing, the materials that we're testing for the CIRA project. Just to add to that, I would say in CIOA, there's this multi-prong approach. So one aspect of the program is breeding nematode resistant lines that will then be taken up by seed industry and integrated into cultivars uh, to spread, you know, the number of cultivars that are available with that quality. So that's an example of kind of a, a release that's really more of a trait release, but maybe not in a form that is ready for production as a open pollinated or hybrid carrot. And then another avenue is actually developing finished cultivars that we then partner with seed companies to release. Um, and another avenue is creating these breeding populations, combining good quality traits, and then facilitating access to those breeding populations for more of a diversity of on-farm breeding, uh, regional seed companies uh, breeding with those lines. Um, and then also sharing, as Phil said, you know, as we're screening these, the, the public collection, uh, documenting the performance of some of those lines and the history of them, and then sharing that information publicly so it's more widely available for others to access our, our public seed collection. Maybe next slide, I think. Uh, so. Yeah, so great. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kenobi Project, which is a partner uh, program up here in Canada. My name is Chris Thoreau, and I've been working with the Kenobi uh, program uh, in one capacity or another since 2018. Uh, so Kenobi stands for the Canadian Organic Vegetable Improvement Project, which is a multi-year program to build a collaborative network of farmers, researchers and industry stakeholders in Canada, and it has multiple goals. And they're they're very similar to what's happening with CIOA. Uh, so with the trials, we're getting the chance to test varieties for adaptation to different uh, agricultural practices, nutrition and flavor, and then also looking at domestic seed production potential in Canada with carrots. That allows us to generate and share useful varietal data with farmers and seed producers to better understand the varieties. Uh, we're also looking at identifying the best performing varieties in different farming systems. So we get a chance to look at breeding lines, which we'll talk about, but it also gives farmers to trial other commercial varieties because they might find something that's already going to work on their farm that they're not uh, already aware of. Uh, we do collect and analyze data to assess crop for performance in organic systems, uh, which is uh, sort of under the category of crop functional traits. Uh, and that's in a partnership with Marty Isaac at the University of Toronto. Uh, and then we use this to implement on-farm participatory plant breeding projects in order to develop new varieties. And of course, all this allows us to build farmer capacity for on-farm trialing and breeding, uh, which again, uh, is just a chance to identify and participate in um, variety selection and development. 
So Kenovi is, uh, even though it's a Canadian uh, project, it is modeled on the US-based Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative, and it's using what's called the mother-daughter model. So in this model, you have a mother research site where trials are done in, in triplicate or more, and they undergo a much more robust data collection and analysis process. And then you have the daughter sites, which are basically the participant organic farms, uh, which are laid, uh, located throughout the country, or throughout both countries in this case. So the mother site for Kenovi is currently at UBC Farm here in British Columbia. And over the years, we've had a few other farms that have also been um, uh, growing trials in triplicate for more data analysis. So for us, uh, orange carrot trials began in 2018. And much like in the US, this was really in response to BC's uh, grower interest in developing a, like a sweet, deep orange, open pollinated nonce variety uh, that could be produced for both roots and seed and was a good storage carrot. And part of this was developing an open pollinated replacement uh, potential for workhorse hybrids like Bolero. Uh, and this is sort of in an effort to really strengthen regional and Canadian seed security. Uh, we are very, very reliant on imported seeds here in Canada. Um, so uh, being able to produce more close to home would give us more security. So yeah, the Kenovi trials give us a chance to breed, to test our breeding lines against commercial OP and hybrid varieties to compare performance. And again, also helping participant farmers identify current varieties that may perform well on their farms. So along with the orange varieties we trialed this year, we did also include a number of specialty breeding lines and these carrots came from Organic Seed Alliance through the CIOA uh, project. And this was another effort to introduce more diversity of organically bred carrot lines to Canadian um, organic farmers and foster knowledge exchange across North America. So I think we're gonna take our first break here and just check in if folks have any questions about uh, the projects or the organizations. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll move on to talking about the varieties uh, that were uh, used in, uh, in the uh, specialty breeding lines. Well, while you're while we're waiting for a question, I'll just say the photo here is of a variety with a very special name called five six four seven. So this is a, a variety <laughs> that we've been. This is a red carrot we've been trying to uh, to do some breeding work uh, with here up in um, in Canada that we got from Phil's uh, breeding lines uh, down in Southern California, uh, and it's been a very challenging uh, breeding project for us. It's a very difficult carrot to grow but there are growers really interested in having a red carrot here. So uh, that's a project we hope that uh, eventually we get some seed production and potentially can be working towards a new variety. The one question in the chat is, hey, where are the collected data on the 600 lines accessible? <laughs> so to answer that question, it's it's a work in progress. So uh, we uh, have, uh, we've got, information on uh, some level of information on on um, all of them but uh, we're in the process of uh, putting together information uh, that's meaningful uh, on a, a wide range of, of traits including things that we've talked about here color uh, flavor uh, also a range of disease and pest resistance uh, um, and um, so that uh, well, I guess one of the big variables is the, uh, the whether uh, uh, one of those open pollinated carrots is uh, a biennial carrots, which are the types of carrots that we grow in, in North America and most of Europe and, and part of Japan and, and Asia, or annual carrots, which is what the original version of carrots was before they reached uh, Europe in the 1500s. Uh, and, uh, Annual carrots are very difficult to grow in our our uh, biennial conditions. So, uh, but anyway, that's one of the major traits that we look at, along with things like uh, flavor and productivity and all the other traits. And putting that info together, uh, we uh, we've got a start on it. We're going to be releasing that start uh, coming up in the next year or so. Uh, we want we've wanted to rely on a couple of years of trialing in order to put some things in that uh, database that's uh, useful. But uh, I would say stay tuned, we'll make a link uh, through the CIOA project and, uh, and something called Keratomics, another database uh, uh, group to have that information available uh, to you. If you have specific questions 
about specific traits, uh, don't hesitate to email me, and I'm glad to share what info we have right now before we get that data ready to go uh, on the on the larger format. Thanks for the question. Um, Phil, do you mind if I uh, throw a link up to your uh, USDA website with the the whole genome carrot information? They might be able to yeah. contact you through that. Uh, yeah, uh, that that would be fine. The one for my project. Also, uh, I don't know if you've got the Keratomics uh, database. That's uh, more got a lot of genomic data, but it also has it will have some of these this the production type of information as well. I would say um, if you go to Keratomics, it's it's pretty heavy on the molecular genetics of it right now, but all of this info will eventually get posted there, and that's the first place that we will have it most extensively posted. But yeah, you're, you're welcome to put that up, David, and if you don't have the Keratomics web connection, uh, you can get it, uh, you can Google search for it. I'll be glad to send it to you after this, uh, after this meeting, this webinar. Oh, there we go. Somebody's put it up, and I'm, I've just put up a uh... A link to your your website. So if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with Bill, there you go. Yeah, thank you. So Michaela, you wanna? Yeah, sure. So we're just gonna this? share a little bit of information about some of the varieties that we shared through the SeedLink trial this year, um, and. You know, I have to say having 50 farms in Canada and 50 farms in the US, we had to sort of whittle it down a little bit. And so what we were able to share was prioritized um, around populations that have been advanced for enough generations that there's some good uh, stability, but still enough genetic diversity that we um, think that these populations might be useful for uh, ongoing breeding, but and and selection and adaptation to different regional climates. But this would also give us a chance to see how they perform across these decentralized locations of seed linked. So one of those populations is what we are still calling the orange strain cross. We need a cooler name at some point in time <laughs> than that. But the idea is when we started CIOA, we had a lot of input from farmers about the qualities they wanted. Some of the things that we've already mentioned: flavor, dark orange color. Another aspect related to storage ability is uh, cavity spot resistance. There's a lot of organic growers who store their carrots, sell them over the winter direct market. And that's where you start to see this cavity spot trait um, express itself. Often you don't see it at harvest, but in that post harvest. Also nematode resistance. Nematode is uh, a major pest throughout California in particular, where we have major carrot production um and and uh not in organic systems but in conventional systems associated with a high use of of uh, soil fungicides so we wanted to breed for all these qualities and and uh rather than breeding individual lines for each of those traits we created this breeding population we also wanted it to be broadly adaptable and adaptive so the strategy is to create uh, a genetically diverse breeding pool for multiple generations of a strain cross with different lines out of um, Phil's breeding program that had these various qualities. And then uh, as those genes kind of get mixed up in the population, what we did was a, a centralized decentralized selection strategy where we were doing trials in multiple environments of a whole range of carrots. And what we would do is we would plant the border rows with this strain cross population. One of the beauties of carrot is you can actually select and evaluate the root before it's cross pollinated with everything else in the field. So we were able to do a trial and a breeding selection at the same time where we were selecting this diverse population under varied environments in Washington, Wisconsin, Indiana, Vermont, Virginia, and California. And then those selections would come back to the Organic Seed Alliance Research Farm where we would vernalize them and plant them out in an isolation cage together. So recombining the genetics after they'd had that environmental selection combined with the farmer's uh, phenotyping selection. So um, yeah, this little background of the strain cross. And I know that's one of the lines that actually has been taken up by the Canovi group and integrated into their breeding as well. So. Next slide, Chris. Um, 
So there's a, a background called or a, a, a historic variety, uh, heirloom variety called Uberlandia. And Phil, I'm going to let you take over here and talk a little bit about the qualities of Uberlandia and the work that you've done to cross Uberlandia with various backgrounds to get improved um, carotenoids, but also uh, I'm, maybe you can remind me of the the flavor qualities that that come out of that background too. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Uberlandia is an open pollinated carrot release out of Brazil. Um, needless to say, it's not a Portuguese name, but uh, it is a Brazilian cultivar. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a heavy Nance type, uh, similar to Brasilia, if you're familiar with it. And uh, like Brasilia, it has a tendency to be more of an annual than a biennial carrot, which is a bit of a challenge. Uh, it's not heavily annual like some carrots are, but uh, it's, uh, so we've been able to select uh, populations uh, in crosses of, of uh, Uberlandia uh, with some, uh, in particular, uh, both dark orange carrots to improve the nutritional quality and orange in depth of orange color, and also uh, to look for improved flavor. Uberlandia is generally an okay flavored carrot, but it's quite variable. And so uh, that means uh, you cross uh, Uberlandia with a good tasting carrot, uh, evaluate the progeny over a couple of years, taste lots of carrots, and you can find some that uh, taste quite good and uh, look for those with dark orange color. And you, up in the upper row, you can see and sort of the, you can see some uh, variation to the right with some dark orange carrots showing up um, next to some lighter orange. And so, uh, you can do yeah, what you see is what you get in terms of nutritional quality of the of the orange pigment, uh, and uh, so that's the process that we've used to improve uh, this derivative of Uberlandia. Yeah, the reason we are interested in Uberlandia is because it is a good grower. It's a fairly smooth and uniform carrot. Uh, and and, and uh, it, it's acceptable flavor, uh, but again, we've improved it, and uh, uh, it also has a, a good texture. It's a trait we've been paying more attention to is juicy texture, and uh, so we're looking for juicy, high pigment, uh, good flavored, uh, good looking, good growing carrots in, in populations like this. Yeah, I would just add that um, it, this is one of the better performing carrots that we identified in some trials in Hawaii. So some of that warmer tropical climates um, and that juicy texture is it's something when you buy it in a carrot and it has that real juicy juiciness. What I've learned from Phil is that in the conventional industry that that tends to get bred against because they don't want carrots that crack when they get dropped in a in a concrete floor in a production factory, but um, it's a really amazing eating quality that we're trying to bring back. All right. Um, so out of out of all of the crosses, Phil, you're welcome to add more on the background of the how the purple orange purple was developed. Um, but it's pretty striking from a culinary perspective when you see some of these different breeding lines that have combinations of colors and um, some of that striping is really beautiful from a chef perspective and crossing those orange background carrots in with the darker purple um, genetic lines uh, has actually really improved the flavor and we do select for flavor in every single generation. I have actually been in the breeding field with Phil many, many times and I can attest to the fact that he tastes every single carrot <laughs> that is selected in his program, literally every carrot. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of diversity within the purple, orange, purple population and uh, some folks from San Diego Seed Company Last year, uh, took some roots home from a winter nursery harvest and did some more selection and have recently released the starburst purple, orange, purple. But it, again, anyone interested in working with some of these lines from a breeding perspective, I think this is one that's got a lot of variation in it still that could be selected toward. Anything you want to add, Phil? Yeah, uh, you, you, yeah, just to add a little bit more, I think you covered it. Nicely, thank you. Uh, but uh, the, the the name purple orange purple refers to those carrots you see in the mix here with a purple core, and uh, that's 
that's our simple minded approach to naming the colors of the carrot. Uh, those without a purple core, we just call purple orange, which is like uh, um, uh, purple haze, for instance, is a purple orange carrot. Uh, this is a purple orange purple. Uh, in some cases, you can see the orange is quite pale. It's almost yellow. But, and, uh, but it reflects some of the diversity in that population uh, to uh, at some point we we'd be looking for developing a cultivar that's uniform for the purple core with darker orange and good flavor and uh, but uh, this is a a good example of uh, of some carrots that are in the process of moving towards uh, a new trait that's really not available uh, in any of the purple cultivars that are available right now. There's a fair number of purples out there uh, now, but um, from what I've seen thus far, I've not seen any with the, the purple core. So a new, a new aspect on a care trait, and uh, it's kind of an interesting one uh, that uh, seems to have a lot of uh, consumer appeal. That's all I've got on it. So, yeah, I'll cover the ahead, Fantasia project. Um, yeah. Fantasia is a not genetically stable uh, at all. It is a diversity mix of carrot. And uh, it actually, I honestly don't know exactly what parent lines went into development of Fantasia because it started out as a school garden project. And we mentioned earlier screening those 600 lines from Gran. That's in addition to all the diversity within Phil's breeding program that he's been evaluating for, for you know, decades now. And so out of that whole field of diversity, when we harvest a trial that's got literally a thousand different lines, what we did was we started, we put a box underneath the, the, the picking table and threw random roots of anything that looked really cool into the box and I took them home and I brought them to our local elementary school and started working with the kids on a school garden project where the kids could actually select, each kid got to pick a carrot that they liked what it looked like, they could taste it, they could name it, they could you know own these carrots. And then they would plant them in the school garden after they'd been fertilized and let them go to seed let them cross. And then in the fall, when they come back to school, they would pick the seeds. So it was an opportunity to educate uh, the school children about the biennial nature, about the biology, about how you do breeding. Anyone can do carrot breeding. It's really, um, you know, there's some tricks to biennials, but it is very accessible. So over many, many generations of mixing these uh, carrot lines together with the kids, uh, interesting bit uh, it, that from, from the perspective of mixing a lot of diversity, the flavor really started mixing up as well. And so there's pretty good flavor across all of the colors in the mix is what we found. And again, they've been selected by kids' mouths and adult mouths for, uh, I think we started that around 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, and we continued it through COVID even with some homeschool kids. And now it is sold by a few seed companies. This year, Ujama is uh, the um, Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance, which is a, a seed company, a network across the U.S. that celebrates diversity and history and culture related to our, our crop resources, our genetic history, um, common cultural history. And so uh, along with several other crop mixes, they're now selling Fantasia. And I think if you're interested in a fun breeding population, there is so much diversity in here. It could go a lot of different directions. All right. You you want to talk you. about this? Yeah, Chris, you want to? Um, yeah, Chris, go for it. Yeah. Oh, this is me. Well, I was going to pass on to Weisha, but uh, this would be an overview of the, the trial we did uh, this year using both the orange and uh, specialty varieties. So you can see a mix of uh, our our Kenobi breeding line, the uh, many of the breeding lines and almost uh, or not even almost stable varieties from uh, OSA and then some commercial varieties like Dulcinea, Bolero, uh, Carnelian, which is another OSA one. So this is a mix of our two trials. Uh, they were done separately, so orange versus specialty. 
Uh, and yeah, so Weisha is going to go into talking about the results uh, from both these lines in both Canada and the U.S. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Weisha Wang. I am the postdoc at UBC. I uh, finished my degree last year and joined Kenobi Projects in August, so I'm still quite new, but I have enjoyed working with this project very much. Um, so today is my honor to show you the results that we got from this year's Kenobi uh, carrot trials results. This slide here shows you um, our uh, participants' locations from um, of the orange tri orange carrot trials. Uh, we had over 80 um, participants registered, but um, from Sydney, we we had 50 in total, 50 of completed trials, and um, as you see here, uh, we the we got um, so there were some even even they were marked as completed trials. Uh, we also we, uh, there were some missing data, so eventually, I had. Uh, 34 participants from Canada and the 10 uh, participants from US that the data were used for in my uh, statistical analysis. And next. Uh, so if you want to um, have an idea what the data points uh, are distributed, this plot shows us all the data points, all the ratings that uh, our participants gave to each variety of the orange uh, trial. So I'm going to talk about orange trials first, and then I will talk about the specialty trials. Uh, here on the x-axis are, are all the orange varieties, and on the y-axis is the overall ratings everyone gave to uh, each variety. So as you can see here, on the very left is the Valero, the hybrid line, uh, and the ratings for this variety uh, most of the ratings landed in four or five. So we had this one to five scales, uh, as you remember from uh, from all the participants. And uh, on the contrary, the very uh, far right on this plot is uh, Uberlandia. Um, somehow it had the uh, tend to have lower scores um, in our in this uh, trial. So uh, next slide. So this result kind of uh, reflected the answer to the question we asked participants, would you grow this again? So uh, Valero got the most votes, like 88% of participants say, yes, I will grow this again. Um, but on the country like Uberlandia, uh, over half of people said, no, I don't want to grow this again. And um, the our breeding lines, Kenobi orange um, and the CIO, CIOA orange flavor and the CIOA orange string cross followed Valero as uh, they, they got over 70 or 80 percent. People say they want to grow them again. Uh, so this table here, I'm trying. Uh, so this results, you can find the results from SeedLinked. Uh, if you log into your Seedlink account, uh, but on Seedlink, it's it's uh, presented as bar graph, but here I'm presenting it uh, as a table. Um, you can see these are the uh, agronomic traits that we ask everyone to rate. Um, they are germination, vigor, canopy closure, yield, uniformity, marketability, appearance, flavor, and overall. Uh, the stars underneath each trait indicates how uh, significant the uh, the difference you can find from variety to variety, which means uh, the more stars means uh, the more difference you can you can possibly find depending on which variety you choose to grow. So um, and also also the the numbers are colored with the higher uh, the the greener the color the higher score they are. Um, Valero got highest score for all the traits, but um, since we are trying to develop open pollinated varieties, we, the goal is to have our breeding variety to 
compete with the hybrid variety. Uh, and luckily, our breeding variety is right uh, following uh, the, the Valero. The Canovi Orange is uh, ranked on the second uh, in terms of the ratings for all the agronomic traits and uh, and the followed by say OA orange flavor, say OA orange string cross. And uh, we are happy to see that our breeding lines compete the commercial lines. As you can see here, uh, the bottom three are the commercial lines. Um, and next slide. So since we have uh, participants across a big range of geographic locations, um, so I wonder what the results will be like if we separated the data by regions. So I divided the data into three groups. Uh, they are East Canada, West Canada, and the US. I know participants from US also from a big range of geographic locations, but since we only have 10 samples, I didn't further divide it into different regions. Um, so as you can see here, again, the stars under each trait shows how significant different they can be from region to region. Um, so in general, the carrot trials in West Canada did better than uh, East Canada and the US. That's uh, one significant result we saw. And next slide. And so also um, from SIDLINKS, there were some participants reported what the climate was like uh, in their location. So the uh, some were reported as average climate uh, or where they had droughts uh, climates where they had excessive rain. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the drought did not make too much difference um, in terms of the performance of the carrots. But one significant difference was when uh, the participants reported they had excessive rain at the beginning of the season, uh, the performance of their carrots obviously uh, had, um, uh, was, uh, they had le less um, lower ratings than uh, the, the carrots in the other climates. Uh, and I, yeah, so now, uh, Let's jump into the specialty carrot trial results. Again, uh, this map shows where all the participants are. Um, those uh, on the map, it shows all the registered participants, but we had uh, also 50 finished completed trials and, uh, and we ended up with 46 in total participants data used for the data analysis. Uh, again, I'm showing you this uh, violin plot of the data distribution. I for the so for the special uh, specialty trials, I grouped uh, the carrots by the color. So um, I grouped Fantasy and the purple orange purple in the mixed color group, and we also had two yellow variety, uh, Zhang De Du and the Y1246. And uh, we had two red carrots, um, Chameleon and R6220. As you can see here, uh, Fantasia had higher scores, tend to have more high, uh, higher scores, and uh, Purple Orange Purple had more uh, widely distributed data points. And uh, in the yellow carrots, Jump to Do performed better than Y1246. And in the red carrots, Chameleon and uh, R6220. R6226 were about the same, but um, the, with data points in, for R6220 uh, more widely distributed. So we also asked, who, uh, would you grow this again? Um, again, I think the answers reflected uh, what we saw in the data distribution. Uh, for example, uh, more people voted in the mixed color group, more people voted they want to grow Fantasia again. And in the yellow group, more people voted for Jim to do that they want to grow it again. And in the red carrots group, uh, they were about the same. Uh, again, I'm showing you this table. 
of the average ratings for each agronomic trait for each variety. Um, and so for one, one thing different for the specialty trials, we also ask people to rate for bot resistance. Um, luckily, all of the um, varieties we have trialed this year had high bot resistance, so we didn't have that um, issue. Um, and you can also tell that in the mixed color group, Fantasia had in general higher ratings than purple, orange, purple. And in the yellow carrots group, Gentoo had higher score uh, in, mo in most of the traits than white 12, 46. And in the red carrots group, the two varieties were about the same. Um, so as Chris mentioned earlier, we had a uh, mother site at UBC. So uh, before showing you the results, I want to show you the climate data. So kind of have an idea what the climate was like here at UBC. Um, so this plot shows you the temperature, the average temperature of each day here from the day we planted the carrot seeds and to the day we harvested them. Um, and I, I need to remind you, this is the average temperature of each day. So uh, the actual highest temperature in that day should be higher than what you see from the data point on this plot. And um, we didn't have uh, rain at the beginning of the season and we had more rain towards the uh, later in the season, which is ideal. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so this is the results we uh, we got from the UBC uh, UBC trial. We had uh, three replicates of each variety, which is different from uh, the other participants that they only have one data point. But we had three replicates of each variety, and what you see here is the average uh, score for each variety. Uh, in general, the uh, results agreed with what we saw from the um, from all the participants, the uh, Bolero still uh, was the the best one, um, but we do see less difference between the hybrid and our breeding population. Um, so the the ratings were similar. So uh, under the under the specific conditions here at UBC Farm, uh, yeah. Next slide. So instead of doing a rating for the yield, uh, here at UBC, we, we did a root count and a root weight. We counted the, the total roots we harvested. We were able to harvest for each variety and, uh, and the marketable. So we divided them into marketable roots and the uh, non-marketable roots. Uh, you can see the data for each variety here in this table. Um, Valero had the most highest number as for marketable uh, roots and also uh, for the marketable root weight. Um, but if you do a per percent marketable root, most of them have 80% um, over, over, around or over 80% of marketable root. And, and but the Uberlandia had uh, quite low, only 40% of marketable roots, which is the number of marketable root divided by the total uh, root we harvested. Uh, next, please. Um, so if we look at the specialty carrots uh, here at UBC, again, I divided them into uh, the groups and um, I will see the results agreed with the nationwide results we collected from the participants. Uh, Fantasia got a higher score uh, than Purple Orange Purple and uh, Jump to Do at, um, I would say the for over overall, the uh, Jump to Do and the White Top 46 were not very different. Only the germination were quite different. Um, and in the Red Carrots group, the two varieties were not too different, but with Canadian the overall score for Canadian is a little higher than R6220. Uh, 
we also have this uh, root count results for each variety. Um, again, they have the same trend of which one is better in that group. Um, Fantasia, we had more marketable roots than purple, orange, purple. Uh, we, uh, in the yellow group, we had more, much more uh, marketable roots from the Zhang Zedu. And uh, for the red carrots group, we had more marketable roots from the Canadian. And do I have, oh yeah, I think that's all for my slides. Uh, I wanna mention that um, every participant, if you uh, log into your SITLINK account, you will be able to see all the results. Uh, you will be able to see uh, all the participants results and you can also compare your result with the like um, average score from, from all the participants. So kind of have an idea how your, uh, how your results compare to others. Um, I think it's a, it's a very uh, user-friendly function that you can you can see um, you can have a better idea of, of all those results and uh, to so it will help you to make decisions of what varieties you want to choose to grow. Uh, and uh, Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think the only thing I would add, uh, I mean, I, I think as most people here know, one of the things that allows us to do these trials and get such good data, not only at the mother site, but, but on, you know, you know, dozens and dozens of farms across two countries is uh, using Seedlink to the software. Uh, and Nico, I think you're with us today. So that's been a real game changer in terms of being able to coordinate, organize and process the data for these uh, for these trials. So I just want to acknowledge that because it is it is a it is making this much more feasible and not only to gather and analyze the data, but also to share it as well. And a lot of the some of the visuals you saw today from Weijar are pulled right from there. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that really is a big factor in, in the quality of the data. Thanks. Thanks so much, you two, and thanks for that amazing presentation. Um, there are some uh, questions in the chat. I'm going to start with those. Feel free to add more to the chat or put your hand up if you'd like to ask some. Um, the first one is just sort of what are your thoughts on why East and West are different? Is it due to excessive rain in the past season out West? Um, is it the rain at the start of the season or the heat wave? And how does this compare to the last carrot trials? And uh, I noticed, Michaela, yeah. you've got some thoughts on this as well. So feel free to speak up. Um, I I, uh, I can go first and then I think other people can ask because uh, I I joined in August. So what I did was uh, the data analysis. So from the data I saw, I think uh, a big factor of making the difference is the excessive rain because I do see uh, more report of excessive rain in uh, the East. So does the rain... Uh negatively affect, is that related to disease or is there really soggy soils that are affecting? I think it's affected the germination. Um, I think the germination was significantly affected and then vigor uh, and probably uh, the, the weeds came in because of they didn't have a very good establishment, um, those factors. Okay, great. And did this, was this similar, um, I can't remember, but was this similar to the past carrot trials as well? And Rebecca commented in the chat there, um, she thinks that the heat wave might have also affected the germ and then the rain came and the weeds were growing, well, like weeds. That's always challenging for carrots. Um, the next question was, was, uh, was the trial that the triplicate trial at UBC, was that blind? No. Okay. I know it did. You did see our breeding line ranking pretty high. Um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, even though it wasn't blind, but we tried to be like fair to each part, right? We, we judge them by, uh, the scale, the one to five scale, and uh, 
we did gave the score according to what they perform. Um, one other comment in the chat from Michaela was that um, she was pointing out that these lines were were um, developed in BC in the Northwest as opposed to the East Coast, and maybe that had something to do with the difference as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if Phil has any thoughts on, I mean, uh, Phil, you've done trials across a lot of environments and knowing these populations, any other theories on the environmental performance differences? Yeah, I, I think the uneven, unevenness of moisture, be it too much or too little, is a, always a big factor. And uh, I, I was curious to know if there might be some disease issues that went along, especially with the higher moisture. But uh, I don't know if that information is available. But um, yeah, carrots carrots uh, very adaptable to a wide range of growing locations, but uh, it, it all of these uh, excesses, uh, one way or the other. Uh, like any other crop, uh, uh, affect the performance. And uh, I guess it'd be interesting to see a couple of years worth of data to see, uh, get a better fix on on what might be behind some of the variation that's observed. But uh, I know that's a lot of work, but but um, that's that's kind of the way you have to make the decisions in looking in the breeding program de uh, decision-making process. Yeah, and I'll maybe add one comment about sort of, I mean, I think one thing is, and maybe you can talk more about this, Weja, we did see the results at UBC Farm being similar to national results, so so that was good to see. But also, I mean, at UBC Farm, we often get very fairly good data because, I mean, we have so much support there. We're not stressed out farmers trying to manage this trial while doing a market garden and other stuff. The farm staff prepare the beds, set up the irrigation. You know, we can be there weekly. We've got support people to weed and all that stuff. I mean, we still have issues, um, but in general, we can get really good data because yeah, there's just so much support and so much that goes into it. So it's hard to know if maybe just like everything gets so much care and attention, often things perform a little better at UBC than they do other places. And so, um, yeah, just something to keep in mind there as well. Great, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna switch to, I noticed Melinda, you've got your hand up. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Um, so I am a, um, micro urban farmer and we use flowering carrots a lot in um, cut bouquets and things like that so there is a huge market for new characteristics in this area so was flowering characteristics part of the study or notated and is there a way to maybe understand um, you know, like a sort of a partnership to be able to maybe bring some new things to the market because there's really only three, characteristics that we have right now. We have um, chocolate Dara, which is sort of mauve colored. We've got white and we've got the green mist from Johnny's. So I'm always on the lookout for, for new things, um, you know, in breeding and what's coming next. Uh, just just to clarify, Melinda, you're, are you talking about um, annual carrots like that produce flower in the first year? Well, it could be, you know, maybe the carrots that you've some of you trialed, they weren't really fit for, you know, market, but they have other characteristics that we could use in flower farming and kind of finding that, you know, path to, to maybe bringing some of those um, new things to market. That, that's Short a answer, very interesting use... question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Chris, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Phil. I was going to say that's a very interesting question. Uh, we've actually um, I had a postdoc a number of years ago that looked into that uh, in a wide range of flowering carrots. Since uh, we're doing seed production every year, we always get lots of flowering carrots to look at. I think the competition in the marketplace is probably AMI, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in terms of a similar cut flower that's out there. Uh, one thing we found is that there is some variation for the wilting uh, of the cut flower stalks because, uh, you know, unless you're growing the plant in your yard, uh, you're going to have to cut them and put them into a vase. And uh, there's a quite a bit of variation for wilting uh, for for the in terms of uh, the long standing uh, flower in, in the in the cut flower setting. And then there's some very interesting flower colors that show up. Uh, some of the wild types have uh, 
the center of the umbel is has a deep purple set of flowers. Uh, in some cases, that can be as big as your thumb, and often it's very small. And then some of them have just, uh, like you said, there's uh, some that have all the flowers are somewhat purple. Uh, so that I think there's some interesting things that could be looked at there, but uh, we haven't persisted looking at it other than anecdotally as we look at things in the breeding program. It's an interesting question. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I mean, if something isn't rooting well or not looking good, we pull it out and get rid of it really quickly. Uh, so we don't even <laughs> let it get to that point because it is a biennial. So to, to to carry something over to see how it flowers because it's not in the research objective, it doesn't happen. Um, but we do for the stuff that we're breeding with that does go to a flowering state. And we are kind of looking at things like a little bit like, like it's a uniformity. Uh, so, you I mean, are they all flowering around the same yep. time? We might take stuff out that's bolting a little earlier, or a little later, um, but it is something to keep in mind. We could keep an eye out. It's more, it's a, a lot of it's about space uh, and management. And then a lot of it is if there are uh, other carrots or other things around that could cross, uh, like, you know, like Amidara, for example, um, then we wouldn't want to have it in there. So, yeah, it's, it's something to keep in the back of our minds for sure. Because, yeah, I know cut flowers are becoming more and more popular with small-scale growers. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. You you might want to, Melinda, look through our, our old our old trial data and find the ones that did the, the worst for bolt resistance and start with some of those uh, <laughs> with a suggestion. I will definitely do that. So would I reach out who would be able to help me maybe get some of those seeds to see if they're, you know, able I to work? I can I can get you a short list of carrots that bolt very early. So, and and actually, uh, if you if you're collecting seeds from wild carrots, that's a good source of uh, of early bolting. But uh, you've got Queen Anne's lace around, and often those have a nice uh, purple center of yep. the umbels too. But uh, but anyway, um, I'll send you a list. Oh, well, yeah, I'll ask you to email me so I can, I know where to send it. If you would please, Melinda. Yes. And there's a, there's a question in the chat just wondering where these different carrot lines can be accessed. And I believe people have been answering and putting some links in the chat. So um, feel free to keep doing that if any of those are missed. Yeah, we put some links of some of those that have been released and are now commercialized. But um, in terms of the breeding populations, if anyone... We haven't really gotten to the part of talking about what's next and how to continue participating in the project. I think it's something that um, that CIOA and Canovi are going to have more discussions and have a follow up outreach to you all, including contacts from everybody who joined this webinar. But if there are specific populations from OSA that you're interested in maybe working with as an on farm breeding project, feel free to email me and um, we can arrange to get you a seed pack as well. Great. There's a question from Nico in the chat there. Did you see different rankings in the different conditions? Like, did we assess to see which ones did best in the drought versus um, wet conditions? Um, thanks for that question. I can look into that, um, but I, I don't have that on top of my head. But what I remember is the ranking didn't change much. Um, if we sort them in that way, but uh, I will need to check back. Yes, thank you. Uh, do, do you mind if I just add a quick comment? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Chris, to share the result, and thanks, uh, which was really interesting. I was just playing with the link here that you just shared, and yeah, it seems that the top variety remains stable, but under the top, you can see different fluctuation depending on drought heat versus wet um yeah it's fascinating um yeah thanks a lot for all those amazing data and, and research okay great yeah. uh, go ahead phil oh go ahead michaela i think that was me oh sorry um yeah i don't know if you want to weigh in on that question at all <laughs> phil but in a separate study we did look at uh, a, a range of, of carrots over four years in multiple locations and compared conventional and organic. And one of the ways that we analyzed that data was looking at ranking of performance uh, or um, an index of performance 
associated with high yielding. So the variety, the environments where overall there was a high yield, mm -hmm. which ones performed best in that environment versus in a low yielding environment where the yields overall were indicative of a less favorable environment. And what we saw uh, across that was there's some varieties that track pretty well, that they yield really high in a good place and really low in a poor place. And they just kind of um, uh, follow along that line. Um, and then we also saw other instances where there are varieties that yielded above average in the low yielding environment and not as high in a high yielding environment. So there is some indication of, of I think that robustness trait that maybe you're alluding to Nico. But it's good. Yeah, I would chime in and <laughs> go ahead, yeah. Phil. I was just say I, I would chime in and, and say, yeah, that uh, sand establishment and early growth is probably the big that along with alternary resistance. Those are the two big factors that in my experience uh, account for a lot of the location to location variation and, and year to year variation. Uh, but uh, there's there's lots that goes into it. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is hybrids. Uh, so something like Bolero is a hybrid, and that that gives a little bit of advantage in some of the sand establishment part of it. And we are including some hybrids in the CIOA project. But uh, looking at OPs, uh, you'll find uh, some variation amongst those as well. Great. Um... Are there? Uh, sorry, uh, to add to Nicole's question, I just checked my data, um, and under different climates, uh, the the rank didn't change. Like, um, uh, Bolero was still the highest, and followed by the breeding lines, and then the commercial lines. I I was pleased to see that flavor didn't vary much, and generally was good. So, <laughs> that's a good sign, I would say. Okay, great. Are there any any other questions? Were wide populations better at anything across the regions? Um, from Rebecca, when you say wide populations, like the the more like the Fantasia breeding mixes, genetically wide, yeah. Anybody can feel free to try to answer that one. I'm not sure if we have the. the the data to be able to uh, uh, analyze that, but um, I guess I'm the person who has the data. Uh, but I I didn't I didn't compare them because uh, when I analyze the data, I feel like I should com compare. Uh, like I I feel it's not that meaningful to compare a yellow to a like Fantasia or or compare reds to Fantasia. So I didn't compare them that way. I only compared the two mixed color but uh, since you ask it i i can look into it later yeah just to she, uh rebecca mentions that she's asking because there is there seems to be some interest in land races and very wide genetic populations from uh from uh, ecological farmers that might be a it might be another trial yeah, I would just um, so, so we, go ahead. I was just going to say some of these breeding pools that we've talked about, uh, like the the flavor, um, uh, what was the flavor texture mix uh, that that was being tested, uh, are are very diverse in their background, and it would be interesting to see if 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 that it might it might translate to to having some carrots that perform in the more difficult to grow areas, but maybe not necessarily be a particularly good for performer in the more uh, uniform and, and ideal growing conditions. But it uh, be interesting to see how that stacks up with the variation for environments. I think the next session we're going to go on to, which is a good lead in, is where do we go from 2024? I just want to make sure there is a hand up. Um, from Gwen's iPhone, I just want to make sure that's. Are you? Are you? Do you, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. And okay, great. So, um, 
I'm not sure. Is the uh, where do we go from here? Is that uh... we're committed to continuing with some collaboration across the IOA and Kenobi, and uh, we've been discussing various scenarios, and we didn't really have that a firm plan in place in time to to report out in this session, but some combination of trials or maybe looking at whether or not there's interest in like a participatory group reading where we could do something um, similar to, as I was explaining that we did trials in multiple locations and then growers sent roots back that were recombined. So there's a little bit more collaborative breeding as opposed to the opportunity to just receive some seed and get a little um, training and do your own breeding. I know for a lot of growers, uh, Queen Anne's lace uh, is a, a challenge when it comes to actually doing carrot seed to seed and that component of the breeding. Um, we also have experience in working with pollination isolation tents. We can do some education around how to create those. I know that uh, several of the Canadian growers have also found ways to construct on-farm pollination tents. Um, I will also say, uh, from a breeding perspective, Queen Anne's lace, the white carrot is dominant to all the other colors, which makes it not okay if you're growing the seed and selling it widely and growers don't want to get a white carrot. But if you're a breeder that's just working with a population, you have a little bit of outcrossing, you'll see it in the very first generation. Um, is there a carrot breeding book you can recommend? We did have a link earlier to a carrot breeding webinar. There, I don't know, Phil, if you have a carrot breeding book per se. I'll also put a link to Organic Seed Alliance's carrot seed production manual, which is um, a guide that is available for free download on our website. Uh, okay, great. Going to the carrot breeding book, I think the carrot seed production guide that OSA has is a good start. And, uh, there, there, there's a couple of chapters I would have if you contact me, I can get you more information. Uh, uh, specifically on breeding approaches for carrots. Yeah, thanks again to all the presenters and all the seed savers that are here. Uh, Phil, for all the work you've done and for the, uh, I don't know how many thousands of years of seed breeding that's happened before any of us were here. Take care, everybody. <laughs>